One of the easiest places to start coding in Python is Google Colab, which sits in Google Drive. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to create a notebook in Google Colab, a Python notebook, which is a way of writing Python code. And then I'm going to use that notebook to um, explain some basic concepts in coding, specifically variables, lists, comments and printing, and how to loop through a list as well. And I'm going to talk about some differences between different types of objects in Python as well, such as strings of text and numbers. So first of all, you'll need to go to this address in your browser. You'll need to make sure that you're logged in to Google Drive. And when you go to this address, you should see something like this. Um, and you should be able to click New Notebook in the bottom corner. Once you do this, it will create a new notebook inside Google Drive um, for you to start writing Python code. And once it's finished creating that notebook, it will look like this. A couple of things to point out to begin with. First of all, the cursor here is flashing within what's called a code block. So this is where you can start to write code. And to run the code, you press the play button to the left. The other thing is at the top, you'll see the file name, like other files in Google Drive, um, can be edited. So at the moment, it will be untitled or untitled too. Um, you can rename that something like, you know, my first notebook or whatever you want to call it so that you can find it later. The name of the file needs to end in .ipynb. That's the file extension for a Python notebook. So let's get started with um, one of the most basic principles in coding, which is the idea of the variable. Um, a variable is a way of storing information in Python. I'm just going to skip to um, the slide summing up some of these points. Um, and uh, you can give a variable any name you want, uh, apart from some kind of special names that, that are used within coding generally, which you'll get a warning if you use those. Now, when you create a variable, you do it by using an equal sign. On the left of the equal sign will be the name that you are giving to that variable. And on the right of the equal sign will be whatever value or information that you're storing in that variable. And you can create different types of variables. So you can store numbers, you can store strings of text, which are called strings. You can store what are called booleans. This is basically either the word true or the word false. You can also create lists and other types of information as well. So let's do that here. Let's create a number variable. The first thing we need to do is give it a name. So this is going to be a variable to store um, the year, let's say. So let's call it current year, nice and specific name. One thing to point out about variable names is there should be no spaces at all in the name. You can't have, if, if I put a space here, then it's being treated as two different words rather than one. So there must be no space at all. You can use underscores. Um, that's a common way to indicate uh, two different words in Python. But um, this is how you should name a variable, just all one word. So I'm going to call this variable current year. And then I use the equals operator. And then on the right hand side of that, the value that I want to store. So let's store 2021, for example and press the play button. Now, the first time that you run code inside a notebook, it will have to initialize and it will just take a little bit longer because it has to connect to a, a server somewhere, which will happen up here. Um, the next time you run the code, it will run much quicker. So it's run now, it's finished, and nothing has happened. If I run that code again, again, nothing has happened. Now, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. It means we've not actually generated any errors for a start. But uh, we might want to be able to see this variable and check that it's worked. 
To do that, we use a print command. So this is the second thing I want to introduce. Um, print is followed by brackets and then whatever it is that you want to print. And it's very useful for printing variables because otherwise we don't know what's in the variable. So if I run this code again, now it's going to print the value inside that variable. Let's just repeat that process again with a different type of variable. Let's store some text as well. Um, I'm going to store the, um, I'm going to store a name. I'm going to call it my name. Again, just an arbitrary made up word for this variable. And again, the equal sign is what I need to put here to make sure that I can give that a value. And because I'm storing some text, I need to use quotation marks. The quotation marks indicate that this is just a string of characters. It's not a special word like a variable or a function or something like that. So let's store the name Paul. And I'm going to run this code as well. Now again, I'm not seeing anything. I'm seeing um, this number printout again because when you run a code block, it's going to run all of the lines inside that. So it's still running this line again, creating this variable current year and giving it the value 2021. It's still running the second line, which is printing that variable. And it's still, well, it's now running a third line as well. So let's add a fourth line this print command as well, this print function. It's followed by brackets, and then inside the brackets, the name of the variable that you want to print. So the name of the variable is my name. I'm gonna play that, and again, that's now working. We can see that this has stored in my name. So that's how to create variables, and it's also, um, an important uh, reminder of the difference between numbers and text. So numbers don't have quotation marks, text should be in quotation marks. And you'll notice as well that when you um, create these types of things in Python in a notebook, it very handily color codes the different things in different ways. So you can see that numbers are, are green, um, strings of text are red, most of the rest of the code is black, but the word print is a sort of a, a browny color. Um, but basically it's a different color, just indicating that this is a special word, it's a function. Uh, and you, you might remember functions in Excel and, and other spreadsheets do special things. So you might have come across the function sum or average. Print is another one of ours. It's a special word which performs a particular function. So we've stored some information in a variable. Let's just talk a little bit about those different objects as well. We've mentioned strings. This is strings of characters. It can be one word or it can be whole sentences. We've mentioned numbers. There are actually two different types of numbers in programming. Um, whole numbers, which are called integers, and numbers that have decimal places in them. Those are called floats. I've mentioned booleans. These, uh, this is basically either the word true or false. Um, we're not going to talk much about that here. And I've mentioned lists as well. I'm not going to talk about dictionaries yet, but I do want to focus on lists. We've also mentioned printing. Again, print can be used to show the results of something that you've done because otherwise you can't see what's being stored inside the code. Another reason you might use the print function is to print some text in the middle of a long line of code. For example, in this code, I might add um, a line at the start saying, storing a number variable. And then I might add another one here, which says storing the text variable. Now both of these lines just print the text that we've put in the, bra in the brackets. 
Notice that we've put them in quotation marks because this is just a string of characters that we want it to print. So when I run this code, it's going to run the first line and print out that text. It's then going to run this second line and store um, this value in this variable. It's going to run the next line printing that variable, a line with some text being printed, another variable being created, and then that variable being printed. So in this case, we're adding some print lines just to tell us where we are in the code as it runs. Now, the other thing we can do in our code is add hashes. Um, hashes, uh, comments, are ways of um, adding some information to our code without it running. So, for example, instead of printing this information, I could add it as a comment. So, store year. And then down here, I could put store my name. And then here I could put print that variable. So what comments do is basically add, add basically a comment to your code. Anything that starts with a hash doesn't run as code. It's just um, stored in the, and it's useful for you to understand what your code was doing when you come back to it later. It's also useful for helping other people to understand your code as well. Now this time when I run the code, the, the other print commands have been removed um, and these comments don't do anything down here, but it does help us to understand what the code is doing. It's a very good habit to get into to add comments to your code as you write it. Um, it helps you understand what you're doing and obviously, as I mentioned, it helps you remember when you come back to it later. So let's move on to lists then. We've created two very simple variables, one to store a number, one to store some text, but we're going to need to create a variable to store a list. Now a list is created using square brackets. Each item in side of all square brackets is separated by a comma if you've got more than one. And those items themselves can be strings or numbers or booleans or different types of information. Now, to do this list, I'm going to now move on to a new code block. We've got all our code up here. I don't want to keep running this over and over again. So I can create a new code block underneath by clicking this plus code button at the top, and that will just insert a new code block underneath. This is quite useful if you want to run different pieces of code um, at different times. So you're happy with this code and you now want to move on to a new bit. So let's create a list. I'm just going to call it um, students. So that's the name of the variable. Again, we've got the equal sign. And because this is a list, we need to use square brackets. Now, the nice thing about um, Colab notebooks is that when you open a square bracket, or indeed when you open a quotation mark, it will automatically close that as well. So you can type in the middle. So let's name some students. Let's have um, Alia in quotation marks, then a comma, and then next we've got George, and then a comma, and then in quotation marks again, um, Ida, and then another comma, and our final name is Tom. One thing to point out here is that the comma is not inside the quotation marks. So the quotation marks is only, uh, are only for the string of characters. The comma separates each of those. Now you can put spaces. That won't make any difference. It will still work with or without spaces. And again, if I run this code, nothing much will happen. Or at least you won't be able to see anything. But what's happened is that it's stored that list of items, that list of strings in this variable called students. And of course we can use print to just check that that's worked.
there we go we can see that list that we've made now we can also store lists of numbers so I'm going to create another um, block and I'm going to call this years and again same process um, But this time we don't need quotation marks because these are not strings, they are numbers. And let's put a print underneath it and run that code and now we can see that it's worked. So of course this is what you would use to um, create and store a list of URLs if you're going to scrape them. And here are some examples just to reinforce that. So a list of numbers would look like this, square brackets um, with each number separated by a comma. A list of strings would look like this. And it's useful to start using the jargon here. This is a string, Birmingham is a string, in other words, a string of characters, text. And it's worth looking at this like a computer does as just a string of characters. Birmingham doesn't mean anything to the computer, it's just these letters. Now then, we're going to look at looping through a list. Um, once you've got a list, what you're going to want to do is to um, go through each item in that list and do something with it. In the case of a scraper, you're going to loop through each URL and you're going to want to scrape that URL. So let's create another block of code here and I'm going to start creating a loop. And this is called a for loop. I'm going to add a comment here just to um, reinforce that. So I'm going to write create a for loop. And with a for loop, the first word is for. And uh, the next word is the name you're going to give to each item in the list as it loops through. So essentially this is like creating another variable name. So I'm going to call this um, year because I'm going to loop through the years. So each item in that list, each year, I'm going to call year. But I could call it donkey. It really doesn't matter. The next word is in and then the name of the list. So you're basically saying for each item in this list, do something. The last thing you type on this line is a colon. So just to recap before we move on to the next line, we've got a number of different parts here. We've got the word for, we've got a word that you make up, which is going to be used to um, store each item in this list as it loops through it. Then you've got in, then the name of the list you want to loop through, and then a colon. Once you've typed the colon, you press enter. And you should notice that the cursor is on the next line, but it's also indented. And that's because this line specifies what you want to do for each item in the list. So this is kind of a continuation of this line of code, and that's why it's indented. We're still talking about what's happening in this list. And an obvious thing that we might want to do is print each item in this list, just to check that it works. To do that, we would write print, and then brackets. Now, what's the item called? Well, the item is, in this case, donkey. That's the name that we've given to the item. So again, just to circle back, we've got this line saying for each item in this list, print this item, or print each item. This loop will run as many times as there are items in the list. In this case, the list years has four items. So this list is going to, sorry, this loop is going to run four times. The first time, it's going to pull out the first item, which is 2021. And it's going to store that in this variable donkey. And then it's going to print it. 
The second time this loop runs, it's going to grab the second item, 2022. It's going to store that in Donkey and print that. And so on through the third and fourth items. So when I press the play button to run this code, we should see it print each item in turn on a different line. And it happens very, very quickly. Notice this is different to when we printed the whole list. When we printed the whole list, all the items were on the same line. They were enclosed within square brackets and separated within uh, with commas. So what we were printing was a list. Down here, what we're printing is each item in that list. And each printing uh, action happens on a different line. I'm going to repeat that for the other list as well. So for, I'm going to call the items student in the list students. And again, I'm going to print that item. And the same sort of result. So this time we've given it a meaningful name. We've not gone with donkey, we've gone with student. But again, this is just an arbitrary name. It just makes sense to us that each item in this list students, we may as well call it student. So that's how a for list works, a for loop. We've got those three essential parts, for a made up name, in the name of a list and the colon. And then underneath, the lines indented underneath. Now, once you've finished writing the loop, you might notice that when you move on to the next line, it's still indented. If you don't want, if you're not still working uh, with this loop, if you're still not um, dealing with the code, you need to make sure that you delete back to the start of the line. So, for example, if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to print loop finished and run that code, you'll see loop finished prints after it's run the loop. But if I left that indented as before, then loop finished is going to run within that loop. So if it's indented, it's going to run within the loop. If it's not indented, then it's going to run after the loop has finished outside of that loop. So again, in the slides accompanying this video, you'll see um, some recaps of some of these key points here. Again, we're reassigning the value to this variable. So the, the word between for and in is a name that we create to store each item in that list as we loop through. To give you an example of how this works in scraping, your list obviously might look something like this, a list of, of um, URLs, and obviously it would be longer than this as well. And you would store it in the same way. And then you would loop through that list of URLs and do something with each URL in turn. In this case, I've just used scraping code goes here to just rep represent that we would have some code there inside this loop that deals with the particular URL um, that, uh, that it's up to in the list. The other thing here is that I've just used I as the name for each item in the list. This is quite a common thing that you'll see when people create lists in coding. It's a very quick way to name an item, to so just call it I. It's a very short variable name, and then that I is used in the code again. One final thing to mention about lists is that you can use an index to access items within a list as well. So if you don't want to loop through the whole list or if you do just want to go to one part of the list, you can access that item using an index. And the index comes in square brackets after the name of a list. So for example, if I go back to my code and if I want to print um, students, that's going to print the whole list. But if I just want to print the first item, 
Then after the word students, I put some square brackets and then inside those square brackets, the number of the index. Now in Python, indexes start from zero. So the first item has an index of zero. And if I print the item at position zero, I'm going to get the first student, first item in that list. If I do it with one, I will get the second and so on. So that's how you print specific items or access specific items in a list. If you use a number that's uh, uh, not in the list, so this list doesn't have a fifth item, you'll get an error which says list index out of range. That's fine, that tells us what we need to know. We've used an index which is out of range for this list. There is no item at position four, which is uh, confusingly the fifth item. Now we're not going to probably use indices much, um, but it's just worth introducing those here as well. So just to recap the key points from this video. First of all, we create a list by using square brackets and store it in a variable using the equal sign and the name of the variable, the name that you want to give the variable before that equal sign. You can access items in a list by using an index, which is a number inside square brackets. And in Python, indexing starts with zero. So zero means the first, one means the second, and so on. And you can loop through lists by using what's called a for loop. This is a piece of code that starts with the word for, gives a name to each item, then the word in, then the name of the list, then a colon, and then underneath indented whatever lines of code you want to run while it's looping through each item in the list. In the slides for this video, you'll find some tasks to try out yourself. First of all, creating a variable to store a list yourself. Second of all, using a for loop to print items in that list. And thirdly, using print to and uh, access different items in a list using indices. So have a go at those. And um, when you come back in the next part, we're going to look at using this in a scraper and adapting some code yourself.